In the first of three video lectures over music of Latin America, I focused on a single song, El Aparecido, by Victor Jara. El Aparecido is a fine example of the musical genre Nueva Canción and paints a portrait of a revolutionary figure whose life was in danger because of his efforts to win some benefits for a very large population, millions and millions of people who endured poverty and oppression under fascist regimes, some of which, I'm sorry to say, were propped up by friendly forces in the United States. In this lecture, we're going to explore some of the text painting features in that same song. I'll just take them one at a time and will then present them as a running commentary as you experience the entire song one more time. I'll start with Victor Hara's use of the Dorian mode. The Dorian mode is a brighter version of the minor mode, still minor in quality, but with this difference. In the Dorian scale, compared to the regular minor scale, the sixth degree, that is sixth scale step, is raised a half step. That changes the direction of its resolution tendency. In the regular minor scale, the sixth step, being only a half step above the fifth degree, wants always to resolve downward to that fifth. In the Dorian scale, on the other hand, the resolution tendency is upward toward the seventh degree. So even a resolution on that seventh degree would seem ultimately unresolved since the seventh degree itself requires resolution. If you didn't understand that, don't worry about it, but do pay attention to this summary. The result is a scale that sounds more active and restless than the regular minor mode. And that high sixth degree suggests something that soars rather than sinks. Now let's take a look at how it's used in the song. In the first verse, the singer sings these four phrases. He opens pathways through the mountains, leaves his trace on the wind. The eagle gives him flight, and silence envelops him. Each of those phrases was four measures long. Each of them ended on a long note, and that long note was a half cadence. Listen to the first phrase. Notice its unambiguously minor key sound. Now listen to the second phrase. Remember that the words of this phrase are, leaves his trace on the wind. The first three notes that the singer sings here are the high sixth of the Dorian scale, in this case, C sharps, in an otherwise E natural minor context. Did you notice the lift in those notes when the singer was singing about leaving his trace on the wind? In other words, flying through the air. The words of the next phrase are, the eagle gives him flight. Again, the singer's first three notes are those higher pitched Dorian mode C sharps. Do you see how that sound fits the sentiments of the words perfectly? Can you imagine a better way to evoke an image of flying? The use of the Dorian mode here is a splendid example of text painting. That is, bringing the words of the text to life through purely musical means. Now let's consider something else I pointed out in my previous lecture. All four phrases in this verse end on something other than the tonic. In other words, on some kind of half cadence. Listen, and I'll point those out. I hope you noticed that the cana, that little notched flute that I talked about and that you saw in the video at the end of my last lecture, comes in a measure early, before the singer was quite finished, interrupted the singer in a sense. 
I'll return to that in a moment, but for now, let's think about all those half cadences. All of the verses are constructed that way, which means that all of the verses in their entirety have an antecedent quality. They have not yet been resolved. How does that relate to the text? Well, think about the fact that Che Guevara was, at the time Victor Hara wrote this song dedicated to him, a fugitive, a wanted man. His life was in danger, and he knew it. If you're living in such a situation, you get no resolution ever, no closure. You have to sleep with one eye open, as it were. Do you understand how chronically unresolved music could paint that text effectively? Can you imagine a better way to communicate that condition through music? Now, about the Cana's interruption of the final phrase of verse 1, doesn't that suggest urgency? An admonition to get on with it, man. Can you think of a better way to communicate urgency than by having the Cana do something that in normal circumstances would be considered rude, interrupting a singer before he's finished his thought? Further, let's think about the rhythmic profile of that verse and of all the verses since they all behave the same way. There's a conflict written into the rhythmic profile, namely the easygoing duple meter known as 6-8 versus the squarer sounding, more impulsive feeling of 3-4. The singer is singing in triple time against the band's duple time. This metrical conflict produces a feeling of tension, of unease, of this against that. Can you imagine a better way of capturing with purely musical devices the real-world situation described by the lyrics of the song? After all, Che Guevara had gotten crossways of some very powerful people. This is a little digression, so don't get distracted by it. Uh, nevertheless, it seems to me an important thing to say, so uh, please indulge me. I mentioned in my last lecture that translation is an inexact science. Uh, some sentiments are simply difficult to translate from one language to another, and a strictly literal translation is likely to miss important points. One case in particular involves the passage from verse 3 that I've translated as, His head is finished off by ravens with talons of gold. But it's entirely possible that a better translation um, maybe more idiomatic, and certainly one that would more fully capture the meaning of the words, would be something like, golden clawed ravens have placed a price on his head. If that's the case, uh, that's probably an allusion to some powerful corporate forces that were headquartered in the United States who wanted Che Guevara dead, and um, who have, incidentally, maintained a campaign of lies against him long after his death. So look into that if you're interested in knowing something about the history of this hemisphere. End of digression. Let's take a look at the refrain now. Here it is, the sesquialtera metrical conflict abandoned for pure unanimous duple time alternating between chords on scale degrees 6 and 7 of E minor as the melody steadily mounts to its conclusion on the high tonic, the moment that resolves all that was left unresolved by all those half cadences during the verses. <laughs> Do you see how this refrain both does the necessary job of finishing the cycle on the tonic and also captures mounting urgency and panic as that melody climbs? Do you see how the dropping of the metrical conflict makes the band sound absolutely unanimous as they urge the apparition to run, run, run for his life? Can you imagine a better way of doing it? Are you starting to see what a genius of a composer Victor Hara was? Here's another thing. The third cycle of this cyclic song is, as I indicated in the last lecture, truncated. 
Unlike the other cycles, which include two verses separated by an interruptive interlude, this cycle simply restates verse 4, and it does so in imitative counterpoint. Imitative counterpoint is what happens when one voice enters after another voice and mimics that first voice while maintaining whatever time interval was established in the first place. In the children's round, Row, Row, Row Your Boat, sung in lilting 6-8 time, the second voice enters two measures after the first, duplicating what the first voice sang and following it two measures behind the entire time. You've done this at some time or another, haven't you? That's a good, albeit simple, example of imitative counterpoint. Voice 2 imitated voice 1 at some established temporal interval. Something like that happens in this verse when it returns during that final truncated cycle. Listen. Hijo de la rebeldía, lo siguen veinte más veinte, porque regala su vida, ellos le Okay, so why do you suppose Victor Hara did that? Um, if you imagine that it has something to do with the words of verse 4, you'd be absolutely right. Look at my translation of the lyrics. Son of rebellion, 20 and 20 more pursue him. Of course, that's a, a description of a chase. And how better could you illustrate such a chase in music? Then by having multiple voices, in this case, the backup singers enter two measures after the lead singer and follow him, pursue him the rest of the way through the verse. And let's also consider why Victor Hara might have truncated that cycle in the first place. Doesn't it seem to you to reflect something like a life cut short? It seems to me that it, that it could, in which case the form itself has become a text painting device. How remarkable. So one more. Um, why would Victor Hara call for the use of the cana instead of the more robust, flexible, better in tune, silvery toned orchestral flute? Well, if you're a flautist in a major symphony orchestra, it's a sure thing that the flute you hold in your hands costs $30,000 or more, and the education you got at the Juilliard School of Music sets you back another few hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, that's obviously not the kind of thing that a laborer on a banana plantation in Nicaragua is going to be able to afford when he can barely feed his family in the first place. But the uh, thing about the cana is anyone can own one. It's a very simple instrument to make for yourself. All you have to know is what diameter and length of bamboo to cut, how to cut the notch in the top that you're going to blow across to make the sound, and where to drill the finger holes. So you could say it's really a democratic instrument in a way that a Powell flute is not. Um, so, can you see how that choice of instruments itself would reflect the overall tone of the song and its uh, overall message? Let's hear it one more time, and uh, as the commentary scrolls, I'll be focusing on the text painting devices, so see if you can relate to them.
There's so much more I could tell you about this song. It's the work of a truly brilliant and also humanitarian-minded composer. And if it hasn't yet wrung your heart, that's a good indication that you need to spend more time with it. But I'll leave that to you as we now need to move on to some dance music from the Ecuadorian highlands. This style of dance music is known as San Juan on account of the fact that it was at one time associated especially with the annual feast day of St. John the Baptist. It has nothing to do with that feast nowadays as it can be heard throughout the year. That's just how it came to have its name. There are some distinctive features of San Juan music that I'll be focusing on. And in preparation for that discussion, I'm going to ask you to listen to a little of this piece in that style. The music you just heard has a title in Kishwa, and there's no way I could do its pronunciation justice, so I'll just leave it in print form and let you hear how the singer handles it. The lyrics aren't all that substantive, since this music isn't intended to be listened to, but rather danced to. I will nevertheless share those lyrics with you when their time comes, both in the Kishwa original and in a rough English translation. The music was played on an Imbabura harp, which is a folk harp found throughout the Andean highlands. It's a simple diatonic harp, that is, there are no pedals for changing the pitch of strings a half step, which is a feature of the fully chromatic orchestral harp. It has a large soundboard, proportionally speaking, and this soundboard is called the golpe because a second player is often involved, as in the graphic that you see here, playing the golpe like a drum while the harpist plucks the strings. 
The golpe player usually has a singer's mic available and sings a few lyrics, as you heard in this recording. There are some important features of San Juan music that you'll want to know about as they apply to all music of that type. A San Juan piece is always a fast, duple-time dance constructed in square, four-measure phrases. Those phrases tend to be equally divisible into sub-phrases of two measures each, and the rhythmic pattern for the second of those sub-phrases will be the same as that for the first sub-phrase. To connect what I just said to the music you just heard, that rhythm pattern which you heard repeatedly in this case was this, ta 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 dum ta da ta tum That was a syncopated pattern that filled two measures of duple time. ta 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 dum ta da ta tum Now, as I said, that pattern can be heard in both the first half of the phrase and in the second half for a total of ta 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 dum ta da ta tum ta 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 dum ta da ta tum However, even though the rhythmic pattern is the same in the second half of the phrase, the notes are different, and the harmony is also different. Just listen to one of these four-bar phrases and notice how you hear the rhythm pattern twice and how the second time you hear it, the notes are lower in pitch. I trust you could hear that. Now, the notes in the first half of that phrase suggest the key of E flat major, while the notes in the second half suggest the key of C minor. Listen to it again and see if you can hear that. Do you remember that discussion of relative and parallel keys that I put you through when we explored a dance from Bulgaria? Here's where the knowledge that you now have of that, assuming you've held on to it, will serve you well. E flat major and C minor are relative keys. They both use the same notes, but with two different tonic starting points. What we have here is a steady alternation between E flat major and C minor, borne along by a persistent rhythmic pattern that never changes. Listen. There are two terms you must now become acquainted with, isorhythm and Andean bimodality. Isorhythm in music means the use of a single, unchanging rhythmic pattern even while the notes do change. And in this particular case, those are the notes of two relative keys, one major and one minor. Major and minor are modes, hence bimodality. This music comes from the Andes hence Andean bimodality. Let's hear the whole song now. Notice that there are only two phrases, call them A and B if you like, with the B phrase usually setting up the sung verse, and the verse itself based on phrase A.
I trust you noticed that the organization of that dance was rather arbitrary. There was no consistency whatsoever regarding the number of times we heard the A phrase before we heard B, and although it appeared at first that B was being used to introduce the singing, there were a couple of places where it didn't. And the sung text changed a little as the dance proceeded, almost as though the singer were making it up on the fly. In fact, I would find it gratifying if you found my exercise in formal dissection to be a little laughable, because, of course, that's what it is. No pattern emerges from such an examination in this case, because there simply is no such pattern to find. This is not music you're going to hear in a concert hall. It isn't formalist music like El Aparecido. It's simply music for dancing. It's music you'd hear in the tavern on Friday night and the performers are at liberty to mold the shape of the dance to the particular occasion. If people seem inclined to dance for a long time to that music, then the music can be extended indefinitely because there's no formal aim to fulfill. In fact, think about that constant pounding on the harp's soundboard, which is what the singer was doing throughout the piece. That doesn't actually add anything of value to the music as music, does it? Isn't it a little distracting if you're simply trying to listen to this as music? Isn't that pounding for the benefit of those who are dancing to keep their steps straight and their feet off those of their dance partners when they're maybe a little tipsy? It's essential to think about music that way. The same aesthetic tools do not apply to all music and you've got to make sure you're using the right yardstick when you take the music's measure. If you approach this as a formalist piece, you're going to be disappointed, but that's because you're applying the wrong yardstick since the music clearly serves an instrumental, that is, non-musical purpose. It's an adjunct to the dance, nothing more. To underscore my meaning, I'm going to close this lecture with the performance of an absolutely gorgeous song, a Peruvian bueno, entitled Amor Imposible. 
sung by Francie Vidal and accompanied on the Imbabura harp by her husband, Edmund Badouz, who makes these instruments. Ms. Vidal is not pounding on the harp's soundboard, as in the recording you just heard, but instead tapping it delicately with her fingertips as she sings. I'm going to take a close look at this song in the next lecture, but for now I want to present it to you for your consideration and enjoyment even before you know what the lyrics are about, although of course the song's title gives it away. Notice the elegant and complex formal organization of the whole. Also, notice the way the song, which is mostly in D major, continually slips into its relative key, B minor, at the ends of sections. That is, of course, Andean by modality, but it is not used here in the simple, predictable way that it is in San Juan music, with its stultifyingly regular alternation between those keys. Here, those key relations are used with great subtlety, and in fact, constitute an important text painting device. When you finish listening and are sure you understand the points that I've made in this lecture, continue to the accompanying quiz. Este caso 